it's, yeah, it's just I mean, it's wild how, how different guys can just have completely different hands dealt to them. You know, we're all built genetically different, wired different. And so some people deal with certain issues differently than others. Uh, some people don't know how to bounce back from certain things. And, uh, you know, some of us know how to reach out for help. Some of us don't know how to reach out for help. And, um, you know, whether you have a support system or you don't have a support system, um, you still got to be able to uh, have enough strength within you to know when to ask for help before it's too late. And, you know, you, I hate seeing the situations as I spoke of earlier of the guy that took a few lives and then took his own life or, and, and other incidents where guys have taken their lives. And so those are the incidents that you, the, the stories that you hate to hear about and you just hope and, and pray that with a lot of these, uh, I'll say these and us sharing our stories, um, some of these people, guys and, 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 and women can um, open up and come out and ask for help when they need it. You know, we just had the, the tennis, uh, I can't pronounce her name, but uh, she, she bailed Naomi. on one of the, yeah, and said she was dealing with some mental issues. So, you know, they, they uh, I think, were upset about it when it first happened, but then uh, with all the support she got, now it's like, you know, she's getting praised for it. But it helps, you know, you see certain, and she's young. Yeah. And especially see a young, successful woman like her to have to deal with stuff like that, you know, it shows how serious it is. So from if I got what you had said on Farzan's podcast, right, you know, essentially it, it seemed as though it really wasn't until you became like a starter in Kansas City in, you know, so about like your third year or so there that you get, you, you start not to have to deal with people talking about you and maybe for the first time in your life talking about you negatively. So is, is that fair that it's, it's not until, you know, I don't know, does that make you like 25-ish years old that you now are dealing with these people that are kind of trashing you uh, for maybe like literally missing one play, but you know, 59 plays are just fine. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it was definitely early on in my, um, I mean, heck that's right. The, the, when you say that you're at, you're playing your best, you know, you're your best athlete. Um, and I thought I was doing well. I mean, heck I came from not being a starter to getting all the praise of, you know, heck he's, he might be our next guy. But it wasn't full-time play. You know, I wasn't a starter. I wasn't having to go out full-time. I can go out a few plays. And for the few plays that I was in the, uh, in the game and I'd make a play, you know, it made people happy. But when, you're, when you become a starter and your role increases, um, you know, you play a more vital part to what uh, – to the success or failure of that team. And so with that being said, like, you know, one play could ruin a game. You know, that could be the uh, – 10 yard touchdown or a 50 yard touchdown. And uh, that's what the people, that's what they see. And that's what they go off of. And so for me coming from, you know, I was successful in high school. I was successful as a kid. I was very successful in college and I didn't have to deal with people, you know, singling me out to, to say um, he's the reason we lost this game. You know, it was more so the defensive reason, you know, the team just lost or they say the coaching staff didn't do something right. You know, all of a sudden you get to the pros and it's, you know, you as an individual that, you know, lost the game for us and, and you're the bad person and you did this and you did that. So I wasn't ready or prepared for that. And especially like having to, back in my days, it was newspapers. You know, every now and then you get you know, uh, uh, an ESPN clipping uh, or footage, but it was a newspaper. so. When you look at the newspaper and it has your name uh, highlighted uh, and either a bad play or, or, or the, the comments under is like how, how Warfield blew the game and, um, you know, how are we paying him this amount of money to do, you know, to give up these kind of plays. And, you know, I looked at it, ever since I was in Kansas City, they brought in a corner every single year to replace me and not one guy beat me out. Not one, you know, even brought in I'm great friends with Patrick Sertan and they brought Patrick in pro bowl corner, big dollars. Patrick didn't beat me out. Patrick started on the other side of me. And so for whatever, you know, the, the people, um, how they want to critique you, uh, I, I held my ground. I did. I did what was asked of me. Now, no, I wasn't perfect. I wasn't I didn't have perfect games. Um, I gave up plays and but the bad thing for me was I just wasn't able to 
to handle the the criticism like the way most others did. You know, a lot of people are able to deal with it. I, I was just one of those that that didn't know how to deal with it. So what would you say then as someone that admittedly didn't really handle that well, like what would be some advice that you would give to people that have difficulty handling that type of negative criticism? I mean, in this day and age, I think it's easier for uh, people if you aren't able to handle it, uh, you know, you could easily speak up, you know, write a post on Instagram or go to your coaches and ask for, you know, I guess, ways of handling situations like this, you know, because they've been in for a long time or ask some of the uh, older players, how do you handle situations like this or, um, and get help outside of football to, to help you deal with some of this issue. The thing is, is you can pay a lot of money to do a job that you love. And the bad part is that you do have to deal with people, whether it's social media, whether it's fans in, in the stands or whether it's fans out in, you know, just regular society. Uh, but you have to deal with that stuff uh, because it comes with the game. It comes with the paycheck. And so um, it's just that at that time, I, I, I wasn't able to handle it and I didn't expect it. Got it. Now, we're kind of talking about taking an L in a sense uh, on a personal one-on-one -on -one type of level. When, when you look at the team now, just sort of not so focused so much on yourself, I mean, you, when you're at Nebraska, did you lose two games in four years? I mean, you might've had one of the most prolific runs anyone's ever had while, while being a college student athlete. How, yeah. how do you go from losing two games in four years to having, you know, seasons where, you know, you, the, four times the amount of losses you had in four years, you have in a couple months. I, I mean, I, were, were you prepared for the team to have that sort of pressure on them when you had basically never come from that level of not succeeding? So as far as I knew of the Chiefs, when I got there, I think they had a 10 or nine or 10 win season. Uh, the year before I got there, because uh, it was Joe Montana's last year. So it might, they might have won more games than that. So I just thought that they, they were automatically a good team. I'd known of some of the big name guys on the team. Um, so I thought that automatically it would be the same thing. You know, I'm going into a team. I'm not going to start right away. I probably, would, I didn't think I was going to play. I honestly didn't think I was going to make the team. And so uh, with all that being said, like going into training camp, uh, and seeing what the team, you know, how they work, you know, um, the speed of the game, the size of the players, the, the, the playbook, um, the amount of pressure that was put on you with every single thing. Like you couldn't leave your playbook. You couldn't leave certain things lying around because you're going to get fined for everything. Um, and everything, you had to be accountable for everything. So uh, that was probably the only thing that was different. Now, on the other side, College was, man, it was just more fun because coming right into it, the team was just amazing. And then to have the winning streak that we had and then to get to those two losses, that was like, you know, who are we? You know, we don't lose these kind of games. You know, we got a new quarterback. We can't really blame the quarterback because our team didn't score a touchdown. That was Scott Frost's first year because the defense – we were as a defense, we didn't stop Jake Plummer from the touchdowns that he put up. So it was just an overall team thing that we didn't do what we needed to do. This wasn't like the team of um, uh, previous teams of before. So, uh, but then again, we had a chance to redeem ourselves in the big 12 championship against Texas. And here it is. We're playing up against um, Ricky Williams. I think his name was James Brown, uh, the quarterback. And Priest was on that team. And so I think uh, Ricky was up for the Heisman uh, that, maybe that year or the year before. And we kind of shut him down, but Priest ran all over us. And just out of the blue, we had no idea who this guy was, but he just, every time he touched the ball, it was a big play. And ended up, we lost that game, the Big 12. And, and we, we gave so many excuses, like, you know, we were sick and um, whatever else. We just we weren't prepared for the big play that Texas had on us at the end on the fourth and one um, and ended up losing, but we uh, came right back the next year and we won it. You know, we ended up having to share it with Michigan, but you know, we were still, we still had um, 
put ourselves in a position to win a national championship, which we had to share. So, yeah, all that's different. But again, you don't get the pressure as a kid because, like, the year that we didn't win it, you know, the fans, you know, they knew we would bounce back. So it wasn't a lot of bad talk. Um, and so then I get to Kansas City. I, I want to say we won four games that first year. And it was all about Marty. You know, Marty wasn't doing this. Marty wasn't doing that. Uh, the team, um, you know, brought in some bad players that didn't gel right with the rest. Um, Elvis Gerback shouldn't have been the starter. Rich Gannon should have been the starter. So it was like, it was a lot going on. So we, we, we dealt with that and, and, and got that first season out of the way. And um, unfortunately, that was Marty's last year with me. And they went into Gunther Cunningham. Um, and I don't know. It's, I hate trying to say what, you know, um, what we did at Nebraska compared to what I've done in the, in the pros because I've had a tremendous career playing football. You know, whether, you know, uh, uh, Naysayer wants to get on and critique me on social media or not. I'm blessed. I was blessed to have played as long as I played. I was blessed to play national uh, national championship games in college uh, and blessed to have played and had a successful career in, in high school. So um, now it's just that unfortunate for me as an individual, uh, I had some things that, you know, that took me under down a dark road during a lot of my professional career. So one thing that definitely didn't take you under is having to change positions. Um, so I, I want to get this on a little bit more of a, a happier note because I, I, of course it wasn't easy for you, but you didn't just have a, a good career. I mean, you played safety in high school and college. You get drafted, they say, hey, do you want to play? Not do you want to, but you're playing corner. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go from playing on like the right side to the left side. So, I, I mean, you had a chance to basically get a taste of everything. So how did you at the highest level of professional football, I mean, there's no bigger stage. Did you learn a new position and then sort of mirror that technique to be able to play on the other boundary? Just like technically, well, the, how, how do you make that jump? At, at the time, I didn't see it happening. So when I got that phone call from Marty, it was basically, hey, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna draft you as a corner. And so there wasn't a, you know, like you said, uh, if ands or buts for me, it was like, yeah, I'm ready for it. But I also thought in the back of my mind, like I wasn't gonna make the team as a corner either because I'd never played the position. But when I got in there, you know, I was behind Mark McMillan, who was an all pro corner. I was behind Dale, Dale Carter, who was an all pro corner and James Hasty, who was an all pro corner. So I got to learn from all three of these guys because it's something that I had never done before, but I was not the size of either one of those guys. Uh, Mark McMillan was short. Mighty Mouse is what they call him, but he was quick to get to everything that you threw underneath routes. Uh, Dale Carter was just a frequent athlete that ran all over the field, never ran out of energy and made plays unbelievably. James Hasty was a technician, big guy, but smooth with everything. He knew everything from the playbook and he put all that onto the field to make his career as successful as it was. So I had to learn something from each and every one of those guys because I couldn't do the things that they did individually. And then when it came down to it, I just knew that spending most of my time with them would help me get onto the team. Because if I'm trying to learn from them and I'm investing my time uh, to try to learn that when it came down to making the team, I'd have these older guys that were starters, all pro guys that had a voice and a position that could, vouch, that, that could vouch for me when it came to making the team. And it worked, right? I, I mean, ultimately you are able to, to put this together. So, um, at the end of the day, is it that players teach other players more than the coaches? Is that sort of the, the secret ingredient maybe to a lot of younger guys being able to, to make the team? It's getting that sort of mentor that's playing the position as well? It is. And so the coaches are going to go through the playbook. Now they have a, that, that, that thing is, heck, I don't know how old you are, but that thing is bigger than an old Yellow Pages book. So I still remember the a, Yellow Pages. <laughs> yeah. So you get a lot of information that you have to try to uh, learn all in a short period of time and making this team. So you, yeah, you learn a lot from the older guys than you do from the, from the coaches. Now the coaches are going to teach you everything uh, literature wise coaches. Most of them, they can't run the plays. They can't do the back pedal drills. They're not going to do the jumping drills. So it's going to be the older guys that are going to uh, pretty much teach you 
um, how to play that position the correct way. Now, I, I want to jump back to Nebraska for a second because uh, Mike Mentor came on the podcast and he said that in the 90s, uh, Coach Osborne had a sports psychologist on staff and there was a nutrition program, which f- feels like it was about 20 years ahead of its time. Is that right? True. <laughs> so Very true. So it, it, is that also part of uh, as the secret ingredient to winning? It feels like they were looking at you in treating the student athletes there not just as football players but trying to take care of you as all around taking care of your mind and your body getting you in the best position to to win of course and so like coach osborne i don't know what kind of foresight he had but he 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 had everything planned and ready for the guys coming in and it made you feel like you know you're at home with a family more so than a football team because you have a guy that's super religious um, that went around and talked to every player on the football team, every single one. And he knew everything about your life. He could sit there and have a story with you and share things um, that you would only think that people that you went to school with knew. And, uh, but he took the time to get to know the guys on the team. And that's when he got, you know, 100% effort out of each and every individual because they knew that he cared that, he cared, uh, that much about us. Um, and so we just gave him everything that we could when it came down to it. And my understanding is that Dick Vermeil is pretty similar in his, you know, leadership and you know, character, basically as a coach. He is. And the thing with Coach Vermeil is he's old school though. So Coach Vermeil is going to put you through all those old school drills, uh, of things that you only did when you were younger, or things that they were doing way back in the seventies and eighties that you didn't think were in play anymore, but, uh, but he also wants the best out of you. He's going to treat you uh, like family. Uh, and until this day, I still talk to him. So he, I, I've had three of the best, you know, and that's, that's going with coach Osborne, uh, coach Vermeil, and Marty. Right. Definitely. And how did, how does Marty compare and contrast to those two? Marty just had these speeches that could motivate the heck out of you. And like he had a lot of one-liners and I'm not one of those that can quote uh, uh, guys word for word, but he just had ways of bringing the, you know, the best out of to get you inspired to go out and, and, and you know, crack a helmet. Um, but it's just unfortunate. I got there at a time to where things were kind of falling apart with the team. And um, so I, I, I didn't get the best of what uh, Marty brought to the team, but I got the best of, of, of who he was as a, as a father figure and a coach. Sure. Absolutely. Now, you know, thinking about the, those Nebraska days in the Kansas City team today, you don't see dynasties happen very often. I, I think what you had at Nebraska definitely is considered one. But I mean, how realistic, because you've seen what it takes firsthand to, to be in a organization that churns out unbelievable season after unbelievable season. How close do you think this Kansas City team is to being able to have any sort of magic that you, you know you've been able to see? That's so rare in the NFL, let alone any professional sport. You know what? It's hard to say if, because you can't say if in, 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 when you when you talk about sports. But if we could, you know, we we take away what what uh, D four did on the the offsides that prevented uh, prevented them from going to the Super Bowl from the previous year and then going into the year and winning the Super Bowl, going back a third year and having so many injuries and having some key components on your offensive line out to where you could have basically, you know, I say we could have won three in a row. But like I said, you can't you can't say if uh, because every team is going to say if. I know uh, New Orleans Saints is going to be like, well, if the – Refs had to thrown the flag on this pass interference, and you know we probably could have won it. So, um, very, very good team that we have. Very, very good team. A lot of fun to watch. Um, you know, even after a disappointing Super Bowl loss, uh, they're still, I think, the number one team going into this season and to play in the Super Bowl. So, um, as long as you can protect Patrick Mahomes keep the key pieces that he needs. Uh, I don't know how much longer Travis Kelsey has, but he's a phenomenal guy to have on your team. Uh, Tariq Hills, the same way. And if we can just keep adding pieces to those guys and keep that defense solid, man, there's no telling how, you know, it could be the next New England Patriots team. I, you, you never know. Um, 
And I, but I, I know he has those those type of characteristics about himself uh, to lead a team uh, to the Super Bowl each year. Oh, that's without question. But but does any piece of you, as someone that's been on the Kansas City defenses that were uh, not the best that they've ever had, think like, hey man, this is great, this high power offense, but you got to make sure that you continue to get high quality guys on defense to make sure that when your push comes to shove, you're able to hold teams, you know, in the twenties, so that this offense can only score in the thirties, and that's it. It's a wrap. Oh heck yeah, and that that was our thing. You know, we we. As a defense, we know we didn't compliment our offense back in the days. You know, Coach Emil put put together a high-powered offense and something similar to what we have with with, with today's Chiefs era. You know, we didn't. I wouldn't not comparing uh, Trent to Priest, but but just the explosion of an offense that what we had uh, with Tony Gonzalez, Priest, Home, Dante uh, Dante Hall, Larry Johnson, those guys. They were able to put up. You know, I, I want to say twenty-five plus points a game. You know, we just had a defense that just couldn't compliment it at the time. And 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 now you have an offense that's easily putting up 30 points a game. Um, and, you know, the defense is good enough. Uh, it, it's just that, you know, last season, uh, defensive line play wasn't the best. And, you know, when you're giving a quarterback a lot of time, the play is going to pick apart most teams. So, um, but hopefully this year, you know, we've, we've, we've passed up a lot of those during free agency and during the, during the draft. So I'm excited to see what the season has to hold. I'm always ready for the season. The day after the Super Bowl, I can't wait to get to the, the next season. So I, oh, I, I'm, yeah. I'm definitely I, excited. I, I kind of wish we could have started the season off playing Tampa just to see see where we're at, you know, prove a point. <laughs> that I, we're not that bad. I, and I'm looking forward to I want the XFL to come back because A, it fills a little bit of a hole in the spring, but be, there's also guys that can use that as sort of a developmental type of league to see, you know, maybe they, they, they were that seventh round pick that didn't make the team, but they get to go to the XFL. Maybe they're able to work on some stuff and then they're able to, to get a second shot. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm certainly addicted to it. It's a money business and if you're not making the amount of money that for getting the ratings and it's hard to survive. And I think that's what's hurting the XFL. So they got to make it more entertaining. You know, I, I like, I enjoyed it last year. Well, the, I think it was the year before. Um, so it was, it's a lot of fun to watch, but they just, they have to get the ratings and uh, the TV deals to, to, to get the money out there. Cause I agree with you. I, I like seeing it and seeing some of those guys who weren't able to, to make the pro team have another chance at uh, still developing their techniques and, and talents to still try to give it another shot at the NFL and it's extra sure. football. That's what I'm saying. It's extra football. If nothing else, it's just, it's extra football. That's true. Now, uh, of course, we talked a little bit about some of the, the mental demons that you had, which would be enough to derail anyone's career, regardless of it's being a professional athlete or not. But you also dealt with back problems that uh, obviously played a dramatic effect in, in the having the end of your career come about. When did, because uh, I think I heard you say that you were taking a couple epidurals a year just to play. You know, when did the back start to really become an issue for you? And ultimately, uh, how did you balance, you know, the, the physical, you know, trying to get ready while also having some of the, the, the mental stuff weigh on you? I, I mean, at a point, I, someone's going to break. Yeah, I think that was the beginning of 2000. I know it was early in the season. So whenever it was the game we played Tennessee and Tennessee where uh, – Latin, Steve McNair's last game, not his last game, but our game against him when we uh, we put him out the game because he was hitting the ribs by Dwayne Clements. I went into the game uh, after went into the locker room and I bent over to untie my shoes and I couldn't get up. So I was confused because I had no pain. And even when I was lifted up, I still had no pain. But then I went back to untie the other shoe. It's the same thing. I couldn't move. And so they just put me on a stretcher for me out in Kansas City, took the MRIs. They found out I had two, two herniated discs. Um, so the coach and the, the GM was like, you know, well, we need him for the season. We can't do the surgery right now. So how do we get him back for the season? So, uh, <clears throat> doc was like, we can give him an epidural shot now, uh, put him on some, uh, core workouts and, um, give him an epidural shot and two weeks later, he should be okay to get to play. And, uh, that's exactly what happened. And I ended up making it through the season. And as soon as the season was over with, I took another epidural shot. Then I took another epidural shot uh, before training camp. 
and I think I took one during the during the season. So I was taking three epidural shots a year until that no punt game that we had against Indy. So after that, uh, my back just completely locked up and uh, the epidural shot didn't take, like it didn't help at all. So I went ahead and did the surgery. Damn. Now, having already talked about some of the, the, the mental stuff, uh, how much did now physically, it's one thing to go through this grueling process of just trying to get ready and play, but when you're at the point now where it's surgery, you have to rehab, I, I mean, how close did it get to really coming uh, undone for you? <laughs> oh, I was, I was on edge. Like I was very, very much so on edge to the point because when I was finally out, um, well, even that after the first year, they brought in a bunch of young talent. Um, I think Julius, uh, Julian Battle, Patrick, Dennis, uh, some other guys were brought in. And then the next year's a lot of other guys were brought every year. They brought in corners. And I all I was always concerned because you know that that was my job. I didn't know if I was going to be able to physically be able to come back and 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 fight for it, uh, especially with having to deal with young talent that I knew nothing about. Um, and then having older guys come in that have played and proven themselves, having to come in and, and fight against those guys to, to to hold my position. So it was every year just you know not sure when the back was going to just completely give out when, you know, I was going to snap completely mentally. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a, a continuous battle throughout the year, every year. Now I, I've heard you say that, you know, mentally, at least you're, you're in a great place with a, a strong support group of, between your family and your friends. Um, so I, I'm glad to hear that, but, but physically, you know, fast forward, you know, give or take 15 years since you've last played the, I, How's the body holding up? Oh, I'm I'm bad. <laughs> I mean, like I look decent. Like I, I walk out, you know, I, I hang out with friends, and everybody's like, "Man, you look good." It's like, no, this this is a is, is a, a painted uh, cardboard box, not even a canvas. This is like, you know, it, it's not what it it doesn't feel what it looks like. And I can barely go work out. I can't run. Um, Cause I have too much pain. I barely get a night, good night's sleep. Um, Cause I have so much pain. I can't sit for too long. Can't stand for too long. Um, I'm pretty sure I've, I've gone to get an MRI and they, they told me I got to have the surgery again. And I really don't want to go through that again. So I don't know if I want to do stem cells cause I don't know what that does. I really don't know if anybody that's gone through it uh, to have it and, and to, to say how good it is for you. Uh, so I, I have no idea what what to do. And, you know, I've always been one to shy away from uh, prescription meds. So I take Tylenol. It's getting me through most most of my bad days. I've heard stem cells for things like shoulders and, and like blood stuff um, for like what Kobe Bryant was doing for his knee. But when it comes to back, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know the, the first thing I um, and, and no one wants to be the guinea pig. Like, I, I can certainly understand why yeah. you're like, hey, man, I, I don't really know if I want to sign up for that. But yeah. uh, last year, didn't the the CBA reduce retired player health benefits? I, I, I mean, have you been paying attention at all to, to that stuff? Have you been affected at all with how the league takes care of former man, players? Man, they're so tight. They're, they're so tight, Wad, and uh, they, they, they barely – past people to get through with the benefits program. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of guys I know that I've played with or played against that are struggling to get through most of their days, um, whether physically or mentally. And none of these guys uh, receive benefits. And so, but they have a tight protocol that you have to go through, you know, seeing different doctors at different times, different places. And so uh, you don't pass those tests and, you know, is, is, is your SOL. So um, right now, I don't, I haven't passed those tests and I don't get anything. So we'll see. I'm out actually in the uh, lawsuit with the concussion thing. And um, I think there's something else that uh, the NFL PA has out there for the players, but I don't know. It, it's, it's tough. And especially when you got friends that are struggling, 
Um, and especially when you have some teammates that call and ask you to borrow money, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good and bad place to be in, you know, you know, you're happy that you were able to play a professional sport. You're happy that you're able to inspire these kids that want to live out their dreams of being um, a professional athlete or just somebody successful in life. Um, but yet it's hard for you to get out of bed. It's hard for you to go to sleep. It's hard for you to do most things around the house, um, you know, but yet you have to find the strength within you to, to still get up and, try to help and share and inspire and motivate a lot of these kids that come from broken homes that don't have proper guidance or um, or think that they're stuck in their um, their environment of because of culture change like I know I, to me like I never went outside of where I grew up at so I never got to see outside of my hood and that's the only thing I knew and uh, you know sometimes they need somebody to explain to them that there's other uh, avenues out there. And there's, you know, if you put the work in uh, and want it bad enough, you can get outside of here and be successful yourself. Came at a price. Came at yeah. a happy price. Yeah. So uh, all that being said, how has been just navigating life after being an NFL athlete? Obviously, you know, physically it's been cumbersome to put it mildly, but just mentally dealing with kind of having to turn that page um, and focus on other stuff. How is this ride in a nutshell been for you? Just trying to sort of, in a sense, reestablish who you are, you know, again, just not having that identifier as current NFL athlete. You know, how, how did you go about that process? You know, the, I, I was fortunate in, in a couple of ways. Um, my best friend was a loan officer at Wells Fargo. And so um, he kind of took hold of my finances and, and did some, some pretty good investments for me. And, and fortunately, I haven't had to work since I've retired. Um, and I could completely see how guys just uh, totally turned the other way and, and, and um, and when they have to deal with some of the mental issue, issues and physical issues, how some of them can see um, despair, I guess you say. And um, again, I know I, you mentioned it earlier, like I, I told uh, Farzan that I had great family and friend support because I do, whether it was in Nebraska or whether it's here in Dallas, my family's here in Dallas. And so my sister, my brother, um, I know I can always call them and lean on them when, when things aren't good for me. In Nebraska, it was the same way. My, my daughter lives out there. You know, my best friend lives out there. So um, it was easy for me to lean and, and um, vent um, in that area also. Uh, but I can see how hard it is for, for, for people that when the money's run its course and you don't have any other um, way of trying to live that lifestyle, or to have, um, you know, we miss out on that camaraderie that we had team-wise and with certain players, or whether it was like how you were treated in society. Now, the thing for me was that I was trying to escape all that. And so going back to Nebraska, it was hard for me to escape it because it was so close to Kansas City and it was right where I played college at. Um, so, but having a, a kid there uh, made it easier for me to avoid a lot of the questions because it was, I, you know, try to make things when I was there, mostly about my life there and with my daughter. Coming to Dallas, nobody knows who I am. I can just be Eric. You know, I don't have to worry about answering questions about, you know, what I did in the NFL or if I played in the NFL or who I was. I can just, you know, go out and eat and hang with friends and do whatever um, without having to face all that. So that's been a good thing about being here. Um, yes, I've done some events, but again, like, Nobody really knows who I am here. And even if I do do an event, half the people don't care because I didn't play with the Cowboys. So they want to know who, who the Cowboys players are. So being a Chiefs player really is kind of irrelevant being here. And I, I, and I kind of like it that way. Well, it's awesome. It sounds like while it has not been an easy path, you've been able to find a way to make it work and find your comfort. Sure. So, 
Um, well, Eric, even though you are just Eric to maybe some people in Dallas, before I let you off the hook, I got to ask you to keep the helmet on for 10 more seconds. I, I got this little thing I call the gauntlet. Uh, it's a couple quick hitter section uh, questions. Oh, we got all the time. Heck, it's, it's early. It's not even not even close to seven yet. <laughs> well, I this is my favorite part of the show because I, I got to ask you a couple quick things, and I want to know what your knee-jerk answer is to some stuff. And that starts okay. with what's most important? Is it having the number one offense or the number one defense? I've seen in many situations to where the offense was phenomenal, but you couldn't get it done without a defense. And I've seen number one defenses go out and be a part of a mediocre offense and still win championships. So I'm gonna go with number one defense. Fair enough. Now you wore number 44. Did that have any significant meaning to you? It had absolutely nothing. <laughs> that was so bad. And the only reason I wore 44 was because when I made the switch from safety to corner, I go into Kansas City and they had already had the numbers laid out. And we had so many secondary players to where they just gave up whatever numbers that were available. They had number 44 sitting in my locker. I ended up making the team with it, so I kept it. There's so many 20-somethings and 30-somethings, and now there's going to be single-digit guys that, like, 44 stands out. You don't see a lot. Of, so I think it's a good thing. Marketing-wise, I think it, it worked out for you in the long run. It did in a way. But it's like, who the heck is this 44? Is he a linebacker? Is he a safety? Like, what is he? So, yeah, I, I ended up making it work, though. <laughs> now, uh, this is asking a lot, but when you think back on, on it all, do you have a favorite football memory, or, or does anything in particular stand out? So my, a few, my first pick six uh, on Jerry Rice. Now I grew up as a Jerry Rice, as a 49ers fan because of Jerry Rice and Joe Montana. And, um, you know, lining up against Jerry, um, I was kind of starstruck. And the quarterback was Rich Gannon. And I was, you know, I had played with Rich Gannon just the year before. So I'm playing against a friend up against my, my you know, guys I look up to. And all of a sudden, I was like, I know Rich is going to try to pick on me first play. And lo and behold, he does. And, you know, I played the play right um, and took it to the house for six points. And so I, I, I have a picture of that. I, I think I still have that, that football. So that play and um, the Dante Hall play out in Denver when he catches the ball and he made like 10 people fall. So that, that's one that I, I still find in awe to see that that little guy do the things that he did. Yeah, that and it's a shame all the rule changes are, are they've just whittled away the importance of the return man. I, I mean, I don't, it, it's basically him, Devin Hester, and then I think we might be at the end of the line. I don't know if we get another game. Yeah, there's some great returners now. Uh, I mean, heck, who do we have? Yeah, you got, uh, I'd even put Deshaun Jackson as a great returner, but uh, Eric Metcalf. So you have you have to in today's game. You have to be a punt returner. There's just like the kick return. Just so seldom do guys get a chance to even return it. Now it just feels like That's the true. NFL doesn't want this to be a part of the game. But uh, yeah, yeah, no disrespect to Eric Metcalf. And um, I even had Glenn Milburn on the show, who is uh, in his time a very good returner as well. That's a throwback yeah, for you. A lot of good, yeah. And I, I throw back before my time because I don't remember that name. <laughs> <laughs> it was just before your time, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's been yeah. a long time. Um, now, to, we talked about the different DB spots. Well, if you could go, what was your favorite spot to line up on the field? I like the left corner. Um, the bad part about the left corner is you're guarding the, the Z receiver, which is the guy that plays off the ball. So you don't get close to the receiver. Uh, the X receiver is lined up on the line. So you get, you're almost face to face. And you, uh, your physical corner is what you really like. But being on that left side, it meant that you got the best receiver. Um, and, and I always enjoy going up against the best. You know, it might not have always been the best results, but it was, it was always, I was always hyped for it. So. Now, obviously, you know, having played for, you know, eight years, the, the number of guys you've played against, you, some all-time greats, but was there one or two in particular that when the schedule came out, you circled the date, you, that's what you wanted, that matchup? 
I enjoy playing against Randy Moss. Now, as far as good as he is, now he, to me, by far the best receiver I've ever gone up against. Um, but Randy didn't have his best games against me for whatever reason. I guess I was more zoned in, locked in when I played against them. Uh, Marvin Harrison had some good games against me. And for the talent that he had with the quarterback throwing to him, that was a hard matchup to, to go up against. Uh, a hometown guy of mine, Rod Smith, was always a good battle. He was with the Broncos forever. Uh, but like I said, growing up in the same hometown, same high school, it was always a lot of fun going up against him. Now, it's most like a lot of the not bigger name guys to where I would kind of fall asleep on and you kind of give up some of the big plays too. But for the most part, if there's ever a big name guy, I, I was kind of zoned in. I mean, I, I know I went up against T.O. and Chad Johnson and, um, you know, had some battles against Tim Brown and, 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 and I, I think I won most of those games. Uh, but it's just that Marvin Harrison always had a, a way of, of sneaking past. And, you know, some of the not bigger name guys were, were the same. Of the lesser known guys, was there ever someone that really struck you as like, hey, why isn't everyone talking about this guy as being, you know, better? Like he, he just always kind of snuck up on you. Um, play for Seattle. Uh, Jackson, I want to say Daryl Jackson might have his name. Uh, he was a little short receiver. Um, but yeah, he was a shifty little guy. Uh, no, knew how to get in and out of breaks, and it was tiny. All the tiny guys were always hard to, to get contact on because they can slide right underneath you, and plus they're much quicker than the bigger guys. Uh, so he, he was shifty at the line and shifty out of, in and out of his breaks, so he was tough to cover. Um, but that's when we played tight uh not tight end but seattle uh they were i want to say they were in our conference at that time so it's kind of puts me way back in the late 90s early 2000s so kind of shows how old i am <laughs> now um pre-game ritual was, was there anything that you, you had to do before you got out there every single game i would get a headbutt from eric hicks every single game and then for the Early to the end of my season, there became a ritual of me eating a hot dog either before or at halftime of the game. Got to get that the halftime hot dog. <laughs> got to get those cars, man. That started. It started with our equipment guys. I had came in and, and was just starving during a game. And I went back to, to Alan and Mike and was like, hey, man, do y'all have anything to eat back here? And they keep, you know, they get some stuff from the concession stand and keep back there for them for themselves. They had a whole tray of hot dogs. So I just grabbed two of them and stuffed them down and went out and had a good game. So heck, like before the games, I go up to the concession stand, the lady would already have a hot dog ready for me. <laughs> I love it. Now, um, players or scheme, which is most important when it comes to winning? That's players. I mean, I know you can put up some schemes together to help players and make them look better. But if you don't have a great player that's, that's going to make you look good, that, that you can build that scheme around, it doesn't really matter. So I have to go with players. Fair enough. Well, man, this is what I have last. I think it's most important, given it, everything that we've talked about. What's the best piece of advice that you would give to a, a young student athlete that just looks at you and says, hey, man, how, how do I get there? How, how do I do what you did? For one, if you know what you want to play, uh, take pride in that. Put the effort in, put the work in. Don't let your size, don't let your color, don't let your speed hold you back. You know, I've got friends, as I mentioned, Dante Hall, one of the smallest guys ever played. Uh, Darren Sproles, another one. You know, people said that size, they weren't big enough. Those guys were very, very successful. Uh, guys that, you know, complain that they don't run a 4-4 four, four or 4-5 four or, or whatever in the 40. Tom Brady is probably the most successful guy in the NFL, and I guarantee he can't run a five flat or jump a 30-inch vertical. So it's just a matter of you critiquing the, the, the position that you want to play in. Put the effort in. Put make Be dedicated to, to, to what you want to be. And if you put the, the, the right time in and the effort, uh, you give yourself a chance. There you have it from someone that's walked the walk at the highest level, multi-time national champion college, eight year NFL cornerback, all for the Kansas city chiefs. Didn't even bring up the Patriots uh, off season that you had to, but man, um, thank you so much for taking the time 
on social media, I know that you are EA Warfield or EA Warfield 44. Is that right? Yeah, that's all right. And I, I can't emphasize enough uh, the podcast because as someone who um, uh, you've be, been doing this for a, a little while now, but as you continue to do them and you guys grow, your audience grow into it, it's Chiefs, Chief Concerns. Chiefs Concerns. Yeah. And that's where you get two two guys that have played for the Kansas City Chiefs, of course, referring to yourself and Dunn. Um, yeah. it, and man, I, uh, I'm glad you're doing it. Obviously, you got a hell of a story to share, and, and I can't wait to see where the road goes. I appreciate you having me on here. And heck, if, if you give me, uh, you're on during the season, I'd like to come on, come on again. Oh, I'll, I'll definitely be on the season. I, I, um, I take a break in December for a couple of weeks. I recharge for a month, but then I, I just rip through 11 months, put my head down and go. Okay. Well, heck, just let me know. Shoot me ahead. Of, give me an email ahead of time or, or an inbox and let's do it.